This is Lakshmi Pamunchak and this is the story behind my stories. You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Lakshmi Pamunchak. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories. I really appreciate you listening. If you go to hankgarner.com, you can go through all of the archives, more than 300 shows, author interviews with the very best people in publishing today. On the right-hand sidebar, there's places where you can subscribe uh, for just about every platform that you could possibly listen to the show on. I'd like to thank some sponsors today for their faithful support and for enabling us to bring you quality content like we do. Uh, Crystal Watanabe from Pico's House is uh, one of the best editors I've ever met and uh, whose work I really admire. She offers developmental editing, line editing, and beta reading. Uh, She's currently booking for May, so go ahead and send her uh, a message now to uh, get your project scheduled with her. She has four proofreaders on staff, so she can accommodate authors with a much shorter lead time than some other editors do. Uh, She's a new affiliate member of the SFWA and she comes recommended by best-selling authors such as Hugh Howey and Samuel Peralta. Uh, Most of her experience is with science fiction, speculative fiction, and middle-grade fantasy, Uh, but she really enjoys editing all genres and can really make your project shine. If you will mention author stories when booking uh, your editing services, you can receive a $75 discount on manuscripts over 60,000 in length or $25 discount on short stories. Pico's House, P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E. Please tell Crystal that you heard about it on Author Stories. Also, the Debt Collector series by Chuck Buddha. Debt is a death sentence. Michael Wright lives the American dream. He works hard every day but still lives paycheck to paycheck. The bills keep piling up and now his 10-year-old daughter requires surgery to save her life. Michael is in a race against time to find money, but how far is he willing to go? Is he prepared to do whatever it takes? Can he defeat a menacing evil that stands in his way? The Debt Collector series is a gripping tale of psychological horror, raising questions about our modern lifestyles and the terrifying possibilities that hit too close to home. One reader described it as if serial killers and Wall Street made friends. Pay up and die, delinquent, bankrupt. The Debt Collector series is available in paperback and ebook formats exclusively from Amazon or free through Amazon Kindle Unlimited. Walk Beside Me by Christine Handy. Willow Adair has a picture perfect life, or so it seems. A stunning model turned wife and mother, she lives in a beautiful home with her husband and two kids in historic Bexley, one of the wealthiest neighborhoods in Columbus, Ohio. On the outside, she has everything. On the inside, she struggles with issues of self worth, spurned by her neglectful husband and hated. By her rebellious teen daughter, Willow never feels she is good enough. She fears everyone she loves will leave. Walk Beside Me is the story of a woman who peels away the layers to find her inner warrior, a woman who faces insurmountable odds and, thanks to her earthly angels, learns to treasure the gift of God's infinite light and love. Walk Beside Me by Christine Handy Thank you to all of our sponsors for making the show possible. If you would like to sponsor the show, please go to hankgarner.com. There's a link in the top menu bar where you can do that. At the end of the show, if you'll stick around, we're going to have an audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have joining me from Jakarta, Indonesia, Lakshmi Pamanchuk, and she is the author of a brand new book called The Bird Woman's Palette, uh, and I think you're all going to love it. Welcome to the show, Lakshmi. Hi, Hank. Hi. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining me. Uh, I understand you're about 13 hours ahead of me, so uh, and and a little jet lagged from from travels lately. So uh, I know we're going to have a great time. Uh, before yeah. we before we get started, though, I always begin the show with the same question, and that question is: What is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or a storyteller? Well, I 
grew up in a bookstore, um, and my I come from a, a long tradition of uh, family um, publishing, and so I, I never um, thought that I would be good for anything else but to be a bookseller or to be a publisher or to be a writer. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I think it's it, it's been kind of like indented since, you know, since my childhood. Uh, but the first um, time that I knew I had to be a writer was when I wrote my first essay at eight, I think it was, and I won um, a, a, like a, some kind of a national, well, it was not some kind of a national, it was a national uh, writing competition, which was supposed to be for 13-year-olds. And for some reason, they took pity on me because I had the goal to um, to submit my thing when I was eight, uh, and I won the prize. <laughs> and I, I was going to be a writer then; I had to be. Oh wow! Um, yeah. <laughs> so, so what what sorts of books uh, did you love as a as a child? Be growing up in a bookstore, I can only imagine just the uh, the like the world was wide open to you. Uh, or, or does it become very commonplace. Uh, I, I think a lot of people think, oh, if I grew up in a bookstore, it would just be like one adventure in my mind after another, or does it just kind of become mundane? Um, well, I mean, it can go both ways, right? Uh, but I was, um, I suppose, um, I grew up with the love of books as a reader. Uh, first and foremost, my, my mother um, made sure I grew up bilingual. So um, I started reading English books, which I then um, came to love, the language itself. Um, um, at around four or five, um, my mother steadily supplied me with a diet of, of, of good, you know, books. And this uh, went in tangent with, uh, with, with Indonesian um, uh, reading material, with Indonesian books as well. So I, in, in some ways, I, I was honing the love of both languages at the same time. And um, I, I would imagine I was always very, I don't know, I was a bit of a nerd um, um, by nature. I always had been. I was very introverted and I found a lot of pleasure and security, um, I suppose, and inner peace when I when I was in a, in a world of my own. And I felt like it was, you know, in, enough ballast for the world. I mean, the world was always a little bit too scary for me, you know. I, I grew up as an, as an only child, so uh, there was that, I suppose. So yes, um, a lot of reading yeah. when I was little. Were, were there any particular genres uh, that you loved more than others? Um, well, um, obviously, when I was um, um, you know five or six, um, also I was um, lapping up all kinds of um, um, uh, s stories. Um, I think I started reading. In it, Blyton, um, that and, and and a lot of yeah, a lot of a lot of fiction, um, I must say. But then, as I as I entered my teens, I started becoming interested in history um, and in politics, and um, so the nonfiction you know part started um, growing. Then I always also grew up with um, politics at the dinner table, so. That became um, somewhat of a yeah of a um, of a of a of an obsession um, slightly, but uh, but I mean I think my 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 prime love has always been my main love has always been fiction. Um, gr growing up uh, bilingual and and uh, you know embracing uh, English language books uh, as well as uh, those from your home country and your native language. Um, what do you think that did for you as a child? Because I, I know growing up in America, uh, speaking only English, uh, you know, you have a very uh, particular view of the world. And, uh, you know, it's not until later in life and, and you meet people that, that didn't come from the same place that you did and, and you, you start to read things and, and, and kind of get a view into, uh, into other cultures and, and other people and, and, you know, your, your horizons broaden. Uh, I can imagine as a child, uh, having all of that available to you had to be a real, uh, eye opening experience that, that a lot of other kids didn't get the benefit of. Right. Um, my particular uh, situation at the time was that I um, I was lucky enough to have not just grown with uh, grown up with a um, um, the literature 
um, of both languages, I mean, but uh, but also the cultures, because uh, both my parents were, um, were had studied um, in Europe uh, for at least a quarter of their lives. Uh, so they speak um, German, they speak English, they speak Dutch, uh, they, they mainly speak Dutch to each other, uh, because of course um, we were colonized by the Dutch for 350 years, so so that was part of, of, of their education as well. Um, so I grew up with these languages, these foreign languages being, you know, being um, being spoken actively um, in at home, uh, but I was also um, um, uh, at a family, um, traveled to Europe and UK, and so um, I the idea of being, you know, being world out there was not, you know, a complete alien to me. Um, so I could, um, I, I always link um, what I read with, with some of the that helped. Right. Um, when did you know that you uh, were going to be a writer? I, I know that you, you kind of grew, grew up around it and you thought that this was, you know, this is kind of what I'll do, but when did it really set in uh, that this was going to be your career path that you pursued? Well, the most recent um, um, part of it uh, took place when I was um, um, about seven, when I was writing with some kind of you know, some kind of uh, purpose, um, sense of purpose. Uh, when I started giving myself a task of writing a short story every single day, and it had to somehow end the page. I mean, no matter what, <laughs> you know, um, how the story went and, and what it just ended. And I gave myself, you know, the, these constant exercises as some kind of, a, I don't know, a, a daily task. It was a, um, it was like a film to me. And I, and I sort of found comfort and fun in, in writing. And um, I remember, um, also this kind of realization um, took place when I was, um, I was slightly older. And that was when I just finished um, high school and I had to, I choose my, my uh, field of study, a discipline, and some kind of um, pragmatism. I um, chose and a political science and um, Asian studies. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I, I wanted very much to do literature at the time, but my parents had been had a little skeptical, and and so I always kind of like nurtured that that, um, that desire. And as soon as I um, was at university. I started finding ways to to write in journals and to write um, uh, for uh, newspapers, um, you know, articles, uh, feature, feature articles. Um, and when I started my Jakarta, which is supposed to have been a tribute to Jakarta, um, um, to eating well in Jakarta, uh, was like a new take um, on on food writing. I knew that whatever it was in, I had to turn it into a book. Um, and whatever I get to do in life, um, whatever I do to earn a living. Um, the writing cannot be, cannot be, you know, um, um, far of it is what what I do. So what what, what was the uh, the Jakarta Food Guide? What what was? Uh, how did you start writing that, and and how was that published? Um, well, I was just trying to do what others hadn't done <laughs> at the time. It was just like I was just. Uh, um, yeah, I was just trying to fill a void. Actually, I've always liked eating. I mean, it was something that was very much part of growing up with my parents. They um, not only um, that they um, give me the pleasure, you know, of, of growing up with a with a fantastic kitchen at home, uh, always turning out fantastic food. But uh, they also took me out to eat uh, from a very young age. So I became very adventurous in my taste buds. And um, I remember coming back from Melbourne. That was when it started. I I, I had my daughter when I was 23 so I was a young mother and I went to um, to Melbourne uh, to live there to uh, accompany my then husband he'd um, since passed away um, for his MBA and when he came back to Jakarta I realized that um, Jakarta needed something like what I saw in Melbourne all the time a food guide so the a food guide was as essential as the love of eating too you know like a um, and and a food guide that that is that is not just um, tell you where to eat but it you know um, bring out every sensory aspect of of a dining experience not just about culinary merits consistency of of the food on offer but also you know the the the, 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 the feeling you get from from eating at a restaurant the ambiance the the, um, the conversations you overhear the the um, yeah, all the uh, the scents and the colors and all the you know the things that you that you feel or you might not feel also if you're really too into your food. So things like that, you know. And and at the time, uh, food writing had was was really at its inception. It was 
very much um, um, built advertorials mostly, and and there wasn't um, there wasn't um, um, very much what you would call food writing as a genre. So so. Um, there was so much to mine from languages, from the Indonesian languages, Lingua Franca, because we, you know, have many beautiful um, uh, regional um, languages with so much vocabulary that could be used um, to describe food and, and the sensations of eating. Um, yeah, so I wanted to do all that, and these were huge um, books. Um, this would, uh, on average, uh, was supposed to have been an, an annually updated. Um, um, uh, Tome, <laughs> and uh, and and they, you know, uh, and and done, you know, solely by me. Um, you know, I was like, um, you know, I was a I was a single fighter. I would go to restaurants and I would eat um, uh, there and not tell the proprietors, and I would then, you know, start writing furiously about, it and I would, you know, and I would um, always finish um, the write up for every uh, restaurant that I that I or eatery that I um, uh, s I sampled. Um, the, on the very day itself, and uh, again, it was like a, an exercise. It was, it had its own discipline. Um, but uh, these, I'm talking about easily 500 page um, books um, comprising fine dining to street food. So it really was a labor of love. Yeah. What do you think that uh, that through that experience uh, you learned about storytelling? Uh, because uh, I, I'm getting the the feeling from you that that what really uh, what your goal was was to not just uh, give a report about food, but to really bring people into the experience of it and to really experience Indonesia uh, the way that you see Indonesia and the way that. Uh, that you experience these different flavors and cultures and all that. Uh, so I would think that uh, that there's a, a real storytelling component uh, to that that really brings people in and makes them feel like they've had an experience. Uh, so what do you think that you learned about storytelling from that? Um, well, first of all, that there are many stories to tell, of course, <laughs> you know, and, and because, you know, it's eating um, at a restaurant uh, just, you know, um, um, brings – out so many so many things that are related to the experience you know like you you know um, you you might be watching other people eat and you might um, you know you might imagine the conversation between them or what they're you know um, um, how they're um, feeling at the time what they're thinking about the food and so on and so this could really be uh, uh, yeah, um, food for the imagination right um, um, but um, I suppose because I've always been sort of academic Myself, I mean, I mean, I uh, I like to describe things um, um, excessively into detail, uh, and um, I um, I was always missing the the fictional aspect, you know, of um, of of story of of, uh, of food uh, writing, and that was how I came up um, many many years later with the idea of writing a. Some kind of a culinary novel, but with, you know, one which is not going to be just, you know, purely culinary, but but something that would, you know, um, bring out all these um, um, dimensions of 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 living with difference of eat, of, of being in Indonesia, because it is it is such a, um, a, a not monochromatic um, city, you know. Sure. Sure. Um, so tell me about the new book, The Bird Woman's Palette. Uh, so it's a, a culinary novel, a woman's road trip through Indonesia, uh, but it then blossoms into a story of friendship. Uh, so tell me about how this book came about and what's the uh, what's the story behind this book? Uh, well, I'm just going to give you a backstory. It's actually okay. my second novel. Yeah, I um, 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 published it um, at the end of 2014, if I'm not mistaken, in Indonesian, uh, and it was this the, the novel that I, you know, I almost inevitably had to write after um, a long labor with my f debut novel, which took me um, ten years to complete. And it was a it was a heavy historical epic that um, required a lot of research, and it was serious, and the topic was just very, um, yeah, was was very heavy going. And I wanted to write something a little more lighthearted and young, um, and and something contemporary, uh, something that would represent uh, the 
you know, the many kinds of food loving uh, urban middle class professionals in their 30s, um, someone like me at the time, um, and, um, and to, to talk about food um, in a way that also weaved, uh, you know, daily realities of one's profession and one's, you know, um, 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 relationships with people and, uh, and also about the, about the many faces of Indonesia. I mean, Indonesia is not just about culinary diversity, of course, because it has darker aspects uh, to it as well, like, like bureaucracy, like um, ineptitude, like corruption. So I wanted to come up with, you know, with, with, with something uh, that would represent all that, a story that would represent all that, but at the same time, you know, um, uh, set it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a actual um, way than than the, than the first novel. So that was really my um, my job for the time. Well, um, and those are very heady topics, very um, important things to talk about. Uh, yeah. But we know that one of the best ways to talk about really deep, um, very important topics is to uh, couch it in a story and to uh, attach these really great topics to characters that we come to love and we come to believe in and we get to share their joys and their um, their bad experiences as well. Uh, so where did the characters from this book come from? Well, um, Aruna, who is the, um, the protagonist, the, the narrator, um, she... I don't quite, um, you know, I don't, if, if I think about it, I don't quite, um, I don't quite have this person uh, in my life as a, as a real life model, right? But I mean, uh, the, the idea of someone who loves food, who's 35, single and, 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 and married and, and, and proudly so, uh, and, um, and, and a little shy um, and uh, introverted um, and sings a lot, <laughs> you know, observes a lot and, and, and keeps it to, the, to, to, to herself unless, you know, um, she's with trusted friends is, is, is very appealing to me as someone, you know, someone who, who doesn't sort of, you know, um, uh, bring attention to herself, but rather would, you know, listen um, to others uh, more than, than expressing what she thinks. But, um, but someone who, who also has a culinary mind, who, who even dreams about food uh, very, in all of its manifestations, someone who, who is a little bored with, with, her, um, with her day job, you know, someone who wishes to be eating um, her way through life if, if it's possible and, 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 and finding, you know, finding allies in, in, in those um, who are a bit like her and who can in some ways only be herself when she is in the presence of food because it, you know, food brings out you know, brings out um, your voice somehow. Uh, and so that's, so yeah, so, so I wanted someone like that, but someone, someone who is quite plain um, to look at, but, you know, but, but grows interesting as, 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 as you get to know her. And, and someone with also a sense of humor, you know, uh, uh, and, it, and, and it would just like manifest itself when, uh, when, when she's at her happiest, um, uh, i.e. when she's around food. So that's uh, that's the idea um, um, with Aruna. Bono uh, is um, um, is another character. Um, he's Aruna, one of Aruna's best friends, and he, um, like a lot of uh, um, uh, Indonesians, thirty somethings or twenty somethings, these days he uh, went um, uh, to study in in the U.S. and he um, worked in the kitchen of of of, of some. Uh, some very influential chefs and learned from them and 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 he's very, he was hungry he was ambitious he 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 wanted to make a difference back home and he knew that the chances are that he would be um, so much more successful back home rather than you know trying his luck um, elsewhere where a lot of uh, there was a lot of competition so he uh, went to Jakarta and wanted to to try something new and blend you know and and um, um, combine what he knew of Western Cooking techniques with um, with Indonesian culinary traditions and and uh, ingredients, uh, and then the other uh, character Nadeshda is a glamorous, um, um, very cosmopolitan, gourmet travel writer. Um, she's uh, she's very nervous. She's very intellectual, and she um, you know she she has her own insecurities, of course, but she masks it very well 
uh, with sort of veneer of 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 of, of classiness and you know uh, and and worldliness and um, and she she tends to be a little patronizing and 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 um, um, and yeah her 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 friends just you know love her for it but but also make fun of her you know whenever they can so I think these uh, three characters um, kind of represent um, um, that, that sort of, you know, the sort of people, young people you find, um, you know, these days, uh, a lot of in, in, in Indonesia, um, and those who actually do know their food um, and go out and, and, and would like to have fun um, and have something to do with, um, with, with food. Um, the the book is called the Bird Woman's Palette. Uh, what what significance uh, is uh, referring uh, to Aruna as the Bird Woman? Ah, because uh, well, it was supposed to be some kind of a pun. Um, first of all, she. <laughs> but one is that's not you know that doesn't really, you know that doesn't readily um, um, offer itself uh, or describe itself. It. Um, she, Aruna, um, the the protagonist, is um, is an epidemiologist, and she is a specialist on avian flu. So you know, so she studies um, um, avian flu. Um, so I think calling her the bird woman is a is a, is a kind of a clever thing to <laughs> kind of like marry her to um, to subjects in life. And of course, she has a palette. Uh, in Indonesian, um, the title is Aruna dan Lidahnya, and Lidah has two has double meaning. Lidah could refer to the tongue, but it could also be uh, the palate. And of course, in this sense, um, the palate is what I love. So that is why you know we decided on on this title for the English version. I love it. I love it. Um, what do you hope people? Uh, take away from this book. What what uh, what do you hope they experience when reading this book? Well, first of all, I want. Uh, of course, it is. It's also a travel book, yeah. So so Aruna gets to um, gets tasked to um, uh, by you know this is it's a professional thing. Uh, she uh, was sent to investigate um, curious cases of um, avian flu um, around the archipelago that is Indonesia um, to nine cities um, around the archipelago and um, she wanted to to um, turn that opportunity into a very um, kind of you know uh, research I'm sorry that's my cat trying to uh, contribute her two cents um, okay Isabella you've even <laughs> she's been very instrumental in the writing of all this and I have to <laughs> I have to um, say but um, yeah coming back to Aruna I want I want um, I want readers um, who, particularly those who don't know anything about Indonesia, to have the feel of Indonesia as a, as, as this big, big, um, interesting place, a, 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 a place of, of difference and um, and of, of diversity, not not just um, one that um, offers, you know, beautiful um, and beautiful food, um, but also. Um, um, place that is also not perfect it has you know it has its um darker more sinister um aspects to it as well i mean there's kind of this morality um angle to um, to places when 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 you look deeper uh into uh into the sociology of a of a city i'm talking about um, some places in java i'm talking about places in um, cities in uh, Sumatra in the island of um, uh, Borneo and also in the island of Lombok which is a little off um, Java uh, near Bali and and that uh, with every uh, with every um, city or, or region um, there is a wealth of story but at the same time it's um, more than anything it's also about personal growth um, I want um I want readers to see uh, um, a woman, Aruna, who is um, somewhat transformed from her travels, from her love of food, from her um, engagement, um, a deeper engagement with the French travel and through food. Um, and, and, and to see that um, 
and then all of us really have to be to be very disrupted. But really, that was my goal. Well, the the book is called "The Bird Woman's Palette." Uh, by Lakshmi Pamanchuk. Uh, thank you so much, Lakshmi, for coming on the on the show today. If people are just learning about you and your work, uh, where can they find you online? On, online, if they would like to follow along and, and connect with you, um, I I have a website uh, and it goes by my name. It's uh, www. com. So that it will tell you everything that I've um, you know been doing in the world of letters. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. We'll put a link to it in the show notes. Um, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you so much, Hank. Thanks for listening to the Author Stories Podcast. For more great author interviews like this one, go to hankgarner.com and dig through the archives. There's something there I know you'll love. Now stay tuned for a special audio clip from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. No use crying over spilled milk. Eliza hated that cliché. She'd grown up a cliché, her life a bowl of cherries, duck soup, easy as pie, child's play behind a white picket fence. Mother had been the Wyatt Earp of clichés, firing them off, quick draw. A rotten apple spoils the barrel. Smile and the world smiles with you. Every dog has his day. Children should be seen and not heard. She believed them all, particularly this last. Eliza obliged, preferring to wander the streets of Wytheville, Virginia, on her own lonesome terms. The divorce left Laura a spinster librarian, and one false step on icy stairs left her an invalid as well. The accident happened on New Year's Eve, 1950. Laura had just locked the doors of Wytheville Public Library. We must make black-eyed peas tomorrow, Laura had been thinking, with turnip greens. That ensured a lucky new year, and if you swept some money over your threshold, a prosperous one, too. She loved those old southern traditions. She looked both ways, checking for negroes, but turned to heel on the icy marble of the stairs and fell into the bushes below, breaking the long bones in both legs. Eliza had taken advantage of her mother's absence. She'd lost her virginity that same night. She'd swept Ron Partridge over her threshold, initiating her own beloved tradition. She was nursing a hangover, giddily reliving the event, but around 8.30 she realized that her mother had not come down to breakfast. She checked her mother's bedroom, found it empty, took the bus down to the library, climbed the high stairs, knocked hard on the library doors, and heard a groan below. Laura lay under the William Penn Barbary bushes, below the yellow-trimmed windows of the non-fiction section. Her white stockings ran Jezebel red with blood. Sweat and melted snow had soaked her blouse, and her gray forehead blazed. The broken bones didn't kill Laura Merrick. She lay in the hospital, wheezing, her legs mortared up in casts. She had few visitors after the first week. Her church group was glad to fret over a poor thing for a day or two, but they trickled away when Laura had the bad manners to linger. On Valentine's Day, as her mother slept, Eliza drew big, sloppy hearts on her casts. Laura harumphed when she woke and insisted on keeping her legs hidden beneath blankets afterwards. But in late March, something miraculous happened. Laura's self-control dropped. She ranted at nurses, spit at doctors, swore like a Navy pilot dropping F-bombs on Hiroshima. She had dementia, the doctors said. Eliza decided that her mother had just stopped believing her own bullshit. The spells continued over the next two weeks, and Eliza enjoyed her mother's company for the first time. They swapped bawdy jokes, ogled the handsome interns, and chattered like best girlfriends late into the evening. They had long conversations, and Laura spoke her own mind in her own words about things that mattered to her. It broke Eliza's heart when the prim, condescending librarian returned. Laura hardly acknowledged anything that had passed between them. The clichés returned. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. A leopard doesn't change its spots. Nothing is certain except death and taxes. This last proved true. On April 15th, Laura Merrick marked her Bible with a tongue depressor, set it on her nightstand, leaned back against the headboard, and coughed blood down the front of her nightdress. Eliza found her that way 
dead as the proverbial doornail, and yes, the blood was thicker than water, just as her mother had always said. Much thicker than water, in fact, perhaps as thick as molasses in January.